each and every one of you here. Isn't it good to be in church this morning? Yes. In Romans 15, it says, I pray that God, the source of hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in Him. So this morning, while we sing about that joy together.
On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your hearts and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, The one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, Go and do likewise. What an amazing story to hear this morning. What an amazing way to figure out how to make a difference in life. And right now, let's take a moment to thank our Heavenly Father who has done great things. Amen. Father, we are grateful today for this time of worship together. Thank you for visiting us and being with us. We know that your word says when we're together like this in your name, you're with us, and so we have no doubt about that. We only pray that our hearts and minds will be open to receive what you have for us. Thank you for the privilege of music. Thank you for the privilege of singing. Thank you for the opportunity of having the freedom to gather in places like this in our country and just express ourselves in worship and thanksgiving. That's an amazing gift that we have today. So help us to never... Help us never underestimate the honor of what we have today to do what we're doing. Help us to put ourselves into it. Help us to pour ourselves into worship so we're not asking the questions, how did he do, how did they do, but asking the question, how did I do, Lord? How am I doing in terms of focusing on expressing myself to you and giving thanks to you? You have done amazing things. We look at the beginnings of creation and realize what an amazing system you've given us, what an amazing world you've given us, what amazing creativity and variety, what amazing universe we have. And so we look to you, Father, as the amazing creator, beyond our capacity to imagine what you have done. But you've also been the God who's great enough to create all things, but personal enough to come to us through Jesus Christ and through your spirit. Thank you for reaching out to us as a very small but significant part of your creation and giving us your mind, your heart, helping us to have guidance for how to live this life you've given us. Thank you for this day, this time of worship. Thank you for the wonderful songs we're singing. Thank you for the privilege of looking into and learning from your word. Thank you for each other who's here today. Father, we pray that you'd help each one of us to realize the power, the importance of gathering like this, to be inspired, to inspire others, to get your message for us for the day, to get to kind of marching orders and get out there and get life done, get the job done. So thank you for this honor we have today. Would you please help us as we pray for the ones who are going through times of difficulty, times of struggle, times of physical complication, whose lives are on the line, whose lives are being threatened by disease, ones who have lost loved ones recently. May our hearts reach out to them, Father. But surely behind our times of grief and confusion, may there be times of praise and thanksgiving. May there be times when coming to a place in a time like this of worship changes everything in how we're facing life. May this be the hinge day the point of change, the point of getting it finally, in terms of understanding how you want us to look at life and one another. Thank you for our time together today. Thank you for the privilege of confessing our own sins and struggles and problems and issues. Thank you for letting us open our hearts and you don't come back with criticism to us, you come back with grace. Thank you for that. Thank you for every opportunity we have to make a difference in this life. Open our minds, our lives, in every way to how we and learning what it means to make a difference and gain significance by the how we love one another as you've given us guidance and direction. Thanks for visiting with us. Speak to us throughout the rest of this service. 
as we approach you through your word, in your spirit, seeking your guidance. In your amazing name we pray and give thanks. All of God's people said. Before we have a video kind of showing you what's happening in the church life and one brief change to that, if this little connection card could be of help to you this morning, if this is your first, second, or third time here, you've never yet filled one of these out to, to make sure our database is accurate, take the little card, fill it out, drop in the convenience baskets uh, by the doors there. And also, if, you have, if, you've been a, if you've never been baptized since becoming a believer, we encourage you to experience believer's baptism. Maybe you're baptized as an infant, but have you been baptized as a witness to Christ and others since you became a follower of Christ? If not, sign up and put baptism on it. We're going to be arranging a time for baptisms in the future. And uh, also, um, membership. If you would be interested in joining our church as a, an official member, so to speak, uh, we, we love the fact that you're here. There's also membership. There's a different level of being involved. Uh, just sign your card and put membership on it. We'll be working out a date for that as well. Now, pay attention to the things that Justin's going to tell us are happening around here. Good morning, church. This is Pastor Justin with your Heritage Life updates for the week. Be sure to visit our fair booth at the Fayette County Fair. We'll be in the Mayhem Building, giveaways daily, so be sure to stop and uh, sign up for our drawings. Fall sports registration is still open. We have people signing up already um, for co-ed flag football and also girls cheerleading. It's for all kids ages 3 to 6th grade. You can register online um, at our website, heritagewch.com, and the registration deadline is July 31st. If you're interested in getting baptized or taking a membership class to become a member, please contact or email the church office so we can get you on the list and notify you of the next available baptism service or class. And finally, family night is tonight at 5 p.m. Uh, there'll be water slides, so be sure to bring your towel. And um, we have something that the whole family will enjoy. We hope to see you there. Thanks for listening. And we want to do everything that we can here at Heritage to help you and your family get connected. Well, good morning. I've got one small change to what Pastor Justin just said. Pastor Jody came in at the beginning of our last service and said that, unfortunately, due to the impending weather that's coming, we're going to have to postpone tonight's family fun night that he just made an announcement for. So pay attention to our website, Facebook, announcement videos we'll be putting out. We'll, we'll, we'll let you know when the next one is. If anybody, How many of you came to the one a couple weeks ago we had? Woo! few of you good yeah it was a lot of fun my kids had a blast on the, the the water slides and all that stuff it's a great time for families just to come and spend some time here at the church so why don't we stand again as we continue on in this part of worship together why don't you sing this out with me as we sing with joy this morning i sing all my life all i know god's been good good to my soul mountain high valley low i want to sing wherever i go I sing all
think that, that as we gather, <laughs> we can lift your name so high with our voices and our hands raised. You accept this as <laughs> honorable worship. And um, thank you, Father, for just this posture of this time as, um, as we come as a group of people. Maybe our week was not what we thought it was going to be. Maybe the relationships that we thought um, were going to, you know, do something miraculous, it just didn't happen, God. But we can come here as a people in our brokenness, in our suffering, in our hurting. We can come here as a people and just completely forget all of that and just worship the King of Kings. <laughs> and we can worship the one that is healer, the one that is present always, the one that can do all things, even when we might not feel him see you God you're always working you're always doing something God and I just thank you for your presence here this morning and as we just continue in worship I pray that you just receive it um, with a heart that puts a smile on your face Lord Jesus I pray this in your awesome and amazing name amen you may be seated as we're going to actually introduce another song and Nathan's going to talk a little bit more about that we're going to take this time this morning and introduce a new song, um, one that I hope we can kind of work into our, our, our sets in the future. It's one you're probably familiar with if you've listened much to Christian radio, but um, we've been talking a lot about worship these last couple weeks, and Pastor Dave has, has done an amazing job bringing uh, great sermons that, that I believe have been really focused in worship and, and what it means to have good, authentic worship. And if you ask me from my vantage point, what makes a good worship song is it has to be lyrically sound. I mean, it has to bring hope and joy and peace and tell the good news that we all know, right? And sometimes that means telling a story. And there's no better story that really encapsulates all of that joy and peace that we find than the story of Jesus Christ's death and resurrection and what that means for us moving forward. And so we're going to introduce this song called King of Kings this morning. I just want to take you a little bit towards the end. The lyrics that hit me, and I hope maybe that you take something out of this song as well. It talks about after his resurrection that the church of Christ is born. And this gospel truth of old, this gospel, this good news that you and I have, shall not kneel and shall not faint. The Bible tells us never grow weary of telling his story. And so this morning... I hope that you kind of get, get a little piece of this this morning. Feel free to sing along if you're familiar. It's one that I hope we can bring in in the future. I want you to join with Sue as she sings. Let's go. 
light that one up in a week or so. I was looking forward to that. You know, this morning before we launch into the message, I want to just ask you a simple question. Have you, have you sensed any need in your life to have kind of a fresh touch of God's Spirit in your life? Have you ever sensed in recent days life can be overwhelming, life can be complicated, the issues can get kind of deep, and it would really help to have a sense of God's presence and Spirit with you? That, that's what it's okay to pray about and to pray for. So this morning before we even have this, the sermon, I was thinking during the song, first and second service, and having the Spirit kind of flood our lives and change the atmosphere is a wonderful way to pray. It's a wonderful way to keep your heart and mind open, isn't it? We'll just briefly pray about that this morning. Open your, open your mind, open your heart, open your life to kind of a new, fresh, meaningful invasion of God's Spirit. Father, this morning we simply ask you to hear us as we say to you, we want all of you we can get. Uh, we can give you all of ourselves, but we need all of you. And so we pray that you would help each one of us here today, no matter what our circumstance of life is. Would you please just let us ask you for a fresh touch of your spirit on our spirit. Change us, help us, encourage us, lift us, convict us, remind us, whatever it is that we need from you. And so we're open to your spirit being at work and new, fresh, ongoing ways in our lives. In your amazing name we pray. And all of God's people said? Now some of you might say the Holy Spirit fills us once and one and done, but uh, D.L. Moody, the great evangelist years ago, had a response to that. Why do, you, why do you have to ask the Holy Spirit to fill us time and time again? And his response is very cryptic and very accurate, I think. He simply said, because I leak. That's human nature, to leak and to let those kind of things get to us. Family fun night is uh, not is canceled for tonight. No fun this evening. Uh, are you okay to have a little bit of fun in church this morning? You okay with that? Is it all right to have some fun in church? All right. Um, this morning, as we were taking a look at, we're taking a look actually this morning at the last sermon in the series. What in the world are we doing? What is the role, the activity of the of the church in the life of today's world? And we talk about four mission vision verbs. And uh, Larry was going around actually this morning giving away his usual tootsie rolls. And he was asking people how many of the words they could recite. And according to how many words you recite, you got a Tootsie Roll for each word. And I want you to know that over there I was listening in as, Ty, where are you? Stand up, Ty, in the blue shirt. Stand up, Ty. Stand up. No, up, 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 up. Ty got all four of them. You okay with that? Yeah. He's a four Tootsie Roll guy. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Ty. I appreciate that a lot. 
And so uh, we're not going to ask him to say them for us right now. I was thinking about that. But to the four mission vision verbs, the things that the actions, the activities of the church we need to keep getting better at and stronger at and doing more of are the, the four words are these. Great. And guess who got it right over here? Ty was leading the group along with the ladies over here. Four words. Let's say them together. Reach, grow, worship, serve. Reach is all about connecting with other people. It's all about reaching out. It's all about extending our lives to other people. It's about evangelism. It's about witness. It's about all those things. Grow is personal, personal spiritual growth, becoming more and more Christ-like. Growth is also about the church of Jesus Christ adding others to its fellowship and growing as a church. That's a part of our calling. To be satisfied with who we are and who we have here is not satisfied enough. We should be not too easily satisfied as the church of Jesus Christ. Amen? We have room for others. We have room for more. We need to find them, get them here. And the third thing is to worship. The word, importance of worship. I appreciated uh, the words that, uh, that were mentioned this morning, as Nathan told us, that look at the lyrics. You know, whether it's bluegrass music, classical music, gospel music, contemporary music is not the point. The point is, what are we singing? What are we singing? If we're singing the right stuff, it's good stuff. Amen? The right stuff is always good stuff. And we're going to do a survey this morning, have a little bit more fun. So find in your, your, your paperwork this little survey that has these little blanks to fill out. Get, find that right away. Let's take a look at it. Now, I want you to give responses. This. If you have a pencil or pen, check them. If you don't have anything to write down, check them in your mind, okay? But we're going to take a quick survey together just for fun. Now, answer these, answer these little options in your normal state, your, your natural human state, before you got sanctified, before you became all like Jesus, okay? How would you have answered these before Jesus? You ready for this? Okay, here we go. To be first in line or last? Check one. To lose or to win? To tell or to ask? To talk or to listen? Uh, okay, we got you. To be recognized or anonymous? To receive or give? To serve or be served? Somebody say, yes, it all depends. I understand, it all depends. Check them both if you need to. Apologize or be apologized to. I love that one. To help or be helped. To hang with down and outers or up and comers. Whoa. To speak first or to be spoken to, like on the street, you know, if somebody's coming that you see, do you, you prefer to speak to them first or be spoken to first? That's an interesting one. I prefer to get my way or to compromise. What would I rather do or what? I ought to do. Would rather be liked or respected. Would rather lead or follow. Would rather be alone or in a group. All right. Now here we go. Take a look at your list. If you checked as many as four on the left-hand side, you need this sermon. Now, if you checked as many as four on the right-hand side, take a look, you need this sermon. If you checked as many as four on both sides, you really need this sermon, all right? So take a look at this, and we're going to take off now on this amazing message today about that fourth word. You know, it's often said that we live in a consumer culture. What does consumer culture mean? When I use the phrase, a consumer culture, what does that mean? Uh, so among other, and you know, talk about this maybe afterwards. What, what's a consumer culture about? Well, how you describe a consumer culture? I think it's about a number of things. I think it's about what people expect, what people want, what they demand. I think a consumer culture is: you serve me, I call you, you respond, I place my order, you get it to me in a good, in good time. A consumer culture is one where they are in the driver's seat, so to speak, and others serve you. So, consumer culture is basically in two words: serve me. Now, during the virus, the concern was for those we had of those who were in what we call the service industries. Remember that term? The service industries. What were the service industries? The food industries, the hotel industries, the medical businesses, where people were overworked or they were, they were, they were unemployed or they were, it was a struggle for them. But we were concerned about people in the service industries because they suffered the most when everybody was being locked down in our houses. Service industry people. Now, I don't, I don't know computers that well, but except to know that the thing that keeps multiple computers running in a system is called a server. That's exactly right. A server. Computers. 
The word serve, served, or service can mean a lot of different things, can't it? We can use the word to mean a legal document presented. We can use the word serve or service to refer to the first person that hits in a game. We can use the term serve or service to the person who provides us food or some particular consideration. So serving means all of these things. That are, it's a very common term in our culture. But let's take a look at it from a biblical perspective. Let's look at serving from a Christian perspective. Let's look at what serving means as a church as well as individuals. And let's run through some things the Bible tells us. Now, you have some paperwork, but the, the folks who are done a good job putting some things on the screen, we're going to read some scriptures together in a few moments to be ready for these. The first thing I want to mention is the primary concept of serving is about, and in your note-taking guide, is about others. It is not about us. It is not about me. Oftentimes, we laughingly or seriously say, it's about me. Well, serving is not about me. Serving is about, the word is, others. Philippians chapter 2, verse 4. Let's take a look at Philippians 2, verse 4. See what that says to us. Let's read this together. Here we go. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. There's the word. Not just your own interests, but to the interests of others. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10 gives us an amazing passage. We're going to read this one together. We oftentimes hear in churches and by preachers quoting Ephesians 2, 8, for it's not, for, you know, for it's by grace that you're saved through faith. It's not of yourself. And we, we quote this because we say, Salvation is not by works, and that's true. But we fail to read the other two verses with it, and they're very important. So let's take a look at Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. Let's read this one together. Get ready. Here we go. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Look at the rest of that. He balances the thing that salvation is not by works, but once you get saved, you got work to do. Amen? That's what the passage says. It tells us that God has things for us to do. As a matter of fact, one of the most intriguing things about this passage is the last part, which says, which God has prepared in advance for us to do. If that, if that means exactly what it says, what it means, I think, is that God actually has in his mind things you and I and all of us together and individually can do and should do. Isn't that an amazing thought? That God has in his mind things for us to do. It's one of life's great challenges, one of life's great pursuits is to try to pray and ask God to consistently help us figure out what is it you have for me to accomplish today. I think it's a great way to live. That's an amazing passage. So the, the things that God has prepared in advance for us to imagine what those might be and begin to figure out what it is, what God wants us to do and say and accomplish in this world to serve others. The primary concept of serving is about others, and God has things for us to do. The second thing is, guess who it was that taught and modeled service most effectively for us? Guess who it was? Jesus. Jesus taught and modeled service. Mark chapter 10, verse 45. Let me read this one to you. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served. You read that? For, for even the Son of Man. Now, you would think that the Son of Man being also the Son of God being Jesus, you'd think that when Jesus came to this earth as the Son of God, we would serve him, right? But Jesus says to us, I did not come to be served. I came to serve. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. You say, what did, what did Jesus do to serve? He taught. He healed. He prophesied. He encouraged. He warned. He trained. He suffered. He died. He honored at all times God the Father. He provided for us a, a way for salvation. He provided for us grace and freedom, as we've been singing about the last couple weeks so beautifully. He, he served us in all of those ways. Listen, and then he passed along the responsibility to, guess who? To us. That's exactly right. Jesus was the perfect model and example of serving in what it means, and he passed that mantle on to us when he left. He's given us the opportunity to serve. Now, the third thing is, and, you know, and, and frankly, you know, we, we do this in some amazing ways. For example, our church is blessed to have a place like the Rose Avenue property. 
where service goes on nonstop in a variety of ways. And, and we're going to tell you something more about this. In the past week or so, we've been ha having conversations, actually Pastor Joy has primarily, I have also with some other people, about some amazing ways in which the Rose Avenue property can be used and people can be used in a vast array of other, wider, different, more amazing ways to serve. Where do you hear about some of this stuff? It's astounding. So God is opening up additional avenues of service that have been, the foundation has been laid so wonderfully over the years, it's even going to increase more. Where do you hear about this? So it's one of the great things about our congregation, about our church that we have to talk about in days to come. The third thing is Christianity is primarily about following, uh, who? That's right. Christianity is primarily about following Jesus. First Peter chapter 2, verse 21. Let's take a look at this. What what Peter says to us about, about this in 1 Peter 2, 21. Let's read this together. Here we go. To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. This is it. Follow in his steps. A classic book by Charles Sheldon was written by that title, In His Steps. We're going to have an opportunity to talk more about that book at some point in the future and to kind of get into it a little bit. But 1 Peter 2.20 gives us this model statement. As a matter of fact, it's where the, it's where the wristband thing came from, WWJD. That's the inspiration for it right there. That's it. What would Jesus do? Also, WWJS, what would Jesus say? Also, WWJT, what would Jesus think? But that's the model. What, how would Jesus approach this? That's what we're called to pay attention to in our lives. Christianity is primarily about following Jesus. As one of my college professors used to say, we had a great conversation in a class that I remember years ago. This marked my life ever since. We talked about how, how to respond in difficult situations with difficult people. How do, you, how do you respond to somebody who's critical and judgmental and who attacks you and who's just difficult to handle? And then the professor simply said this. He said, if we're going to take Scripture seriously, if we're going to take Jesus seriously about responding to the people, he says, we have to learn to, listen, here it is. We have to learn to do what love would do. That's it. My first thought was, how simple, how surface. Ever since that day, my life has been thinking, how do you live out that particular challenge? Do what love would do. When pressed and pressured, and when you are coming up against people and situations you don't like that are uncomfortable, that really test your patience and your faith and everything else, do what love would do. That's the Jesus model. Okay. Now, the fourth thing is our, our various gifts and talents. And this is, this is really cool. You know, the primary concept of serving is about others. Jesus taught and modeled serving beautifully and powerfully. Christianity is primarily about following Jesus. As a matter of fact, you know what? Um, you know, I think, we, I think we've shortchanged ourselves in our conversation about salvation. Let me, tell you, let me tell you how and why. When we talk about getting saved, we mainly talk about Jesus dying on the cross and forgiving us of our sins. So salvation, as we've been taught, is about getting forgiveness for our sins and giving our life to Christ. But you know what Jesus used to say when it came to connecting with him? What was his challenge? You know what it was? Follow me. That's what he said. His challenge to people, Jesus' own challenge to people was, follow me. Actually, a person can, can, a person can approach Christ, whether it's at the altar, in the bedroom, or in their car, they can approach Christ and say, forgive me my sins, I'm resting on your grace, save me, redeem me, I'm yours. We can do that, but that's not the whole thing. Jesus didn't just say, invite me in. He said, what did he say? Follow me. That was his challenge. So the rest of salvation is not just getting forgiven, getting turned around on heaven. It is about following Jesus. It's a whole life process, following him. And so this is what Jesus says to do, to follow him. Our various gifts and talents are not just about serving people. They're also about serving, here it is, our various gifts and talents are about serving the Lord. Serving the Lord. This is, this is an amazing concept. He says, in essence, the things we do to make a difference in people's lives, the things we say or do to serve, are, don't just end there. There's something else about them. Let's take a look at First Peter 4.10. Let's take a look at this, see what it says to us. 
Let's read this together. Here we go. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. Very faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. Now let's look at Colossians chapter 3, 22 and 20. I'm going to read this one to you. Okay, I'm going to read this. Colossians 3. Here we go. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord. There, there's the phrase right there. You ready? Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart so you'll get the praise of other people. No. So you'll get the highest salary on the block. No. So people will think you're a great saint. No. Listen again. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart, like you're working for the Lord. Not just for people, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. You get that? It is the Lord Christ you are serving. Matthew chapter 25, verse 40. Let's, let's take a look at this. In Matthew uh, 25, 40. Let's take, take a peek at that one. Let's read it together. The king will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. That is amazing. Who was it said that, Pastor Dave? No. Billy Graham? No. Who was it said that? Jesus. He said the things that you do, whether it's a cup of cold water, no matter how you serve or help, the least, the least of these, you have done it unto him. You know, that's an amazing, that's an amazing thing to keep in mind in terms of why we do what we do. There, there's a, it's kind of like, as I mentioned earlier, it's like, kind of like matching funds. You ever heard of matching funds? Uh, one of my friends is in charge of the, uh, the Deep Wells uh, Freshwater Projects for World Hope International, uh, which are great projects. When you spend money to dig, to dig a well, it's an amazing opportunity for ministry. When you dig a freshwater well in some of these countries where people are, are, are having trouble watering crops or they're having trouble staying healthy because they don't have adequate clean water, when you give clean water to a community that's deprived of that, you open up a wide highway for witnessing of Christ. You realize that? A huge highway. Why did you do this? Who are you? And we talk about Jesus. And so water wells are a marvelous way of doing it. And World Hope has this fascinating approach. They say that they talk about matching funds. So people of means have provided hundreds of thousands of dollars and said every single time a church provides the 10000 bucks to dig and sustain a fresh water in the country, we will add 10000 more to it and you can dig two wells. That's what you call motivation, right? That's what you call incentive. And this is an incentive passage. When you do something for anybody that is worth doing, you're not just doing it for them, you're doing it for Christ. That's the motivation. Think in all of your life, I don't do what I do just for myself or just for them. Lord, I'm doing it also for you. Jesus said that. That's the model we're given. Our various talents and gifts are not just about serving people. It's not just about us. It's about serving the Lord. Many of us are already doing quite a bit of serving, is the word. Many of us here today, I want to just congratulate you and thank you. You know, when, when, we, when we give you these sermons, it's, I'm, I'm not saying every Sunday, you know, all, all you're a bunch of, you know, a bunch of riffraff, you need to shape up and listen to what I have to say to you. That's not the point at all. You know, what a bunch of losers. I hope God will help me get you guys on the winning track. I'm talking to a lot of fabulous human beings here today. You are amazing people. Do you realize that? You already are doing some astounding things to make a difference for Christ in this life. You are all serving in many, many, many ways. Nobody knows about, right? You're serving in the dark. You're serving in silence. You're serving, you're serving through leadership and music. That's serving. But you're serving as spouses. You're serving as parents. You're serving as neighbors. You're serving as career people. Many of you are doing things day in and day out to make a difference. There's a positive difference, and God knows it, and God cares about it. And hats off to you. Congratulations. So we're sitting in a congregation of people that are servants. The question today is, is there something else where there's a gap we can fill, either as individuals or as a congregation, which is still there yet to be done? That's the question. Not that we're not doing everything or anything. But there are other things God has for us we need to discover and do. Galatians 6, 9 gives us great advice. You ever, you ever, you ever felt tired? You ever felt exhausted? You ever felt like even doing good stuff, you're just worn out? You ever felt that way? 
Been there, done that, right? Lord, I don't know how long I can keep going doing this, we say. We make hard decisions all the time. I, Lord, do I, do I dare do this? I, I, I don't know if I can take it anymore. In Galatians 6, 9, don't get tired of doing good. For if you persevere, you will reap a rich harvest. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people. The challenge is not that we become exhausted in life by doing good stuff. It's we learn how to work together to accomplish more. I think I mentioned this months ago. One of my friends, one of our friends in Athens, Ohio, gave me this simple acrostic in her work. So we use this all the time. We learn the power and the importance of being a team. And we're a team. Okay, you okay to see us that way? We're a team. We're a big team. Then the team, T-E-A-M, stands for Together Everyone Achieves More. So as a congregation, together, everyone achieves more. We accomplish more as a team, as a congregation. Many of us are already doing quite a bit of serving. Let's figure out what else God wants us to do that can be done as we all lift the load together so nobody gets exhausted of doing the right stuff. The sixth thing is taking this message seriously is about taking serving to a new level. So we just really talked about taking service to a new level. I want us to look at this story. You may be aware, may not be aware, that the story of the Good Samaritan is one of the world's favorite stories. Did you know that? Now, this story goes beyond church life. It goes beyond Christianity. The story of the Good Samaritan is worldwide in its appeal. There have been social, there's been sociological studies made on it. When I was in graduate school for social, social and psych stuff, when I was in graduate school, there was a major study done on the Good Samaritan story uh, to see how people react in certain conditions, who who backs off? Who steps in? Who steps up? Who tries to help? Why they try to help? An amazing study I still have in my files that it was done by the world on this story. But as I looked at the story again this past week for this, this Sunday, and I think we may even encounter this story again in a, in a couple of weeks and take a, a hard, different, new, fresh look at it. But I discovered some things in this story I'd never seen before this week. This is all new to me. But I think it relates to today. I saw in this story, like I've never seen before, some elements of what it means to serve and make a difference. And I want to simply talk to you about it for a few minutes. And in, in, in these terms, here they are, the need, the cost, the results. Let's take a quick look at that. What does this story teach us about the need in any situation? In the story of the Good Samaritan, the need was, and again, this is new to me, the need was clear, obvious, urgent, important. Read the story again. In this Good Samaritan story that Jesus told in response to a couple questions, the need was clear, obvious, urgent, and important. It dawned on me that when I began thinking about how in ways in which I want to give money, give help, give time, give effort, give whatever, I need to pay attention to these things. Because some things I've given help and money to, I, I, I can't see it's zero out of four. And so when, when, you know, I mean, everybody's hitting us up for 19 bucks a month or whatever. And, and I want you to, to take a look at whatever you do in life to help other people. Does it have at least two out of four of these things? Is it clear? Is it obvious? Is it urgent? Is it important? And if it's not, shift gears and do something else. The second thing is the cost. The first part of the cost was risk. This was a deep risk to the Samaritan person. You read this story, it was apparently a Jewish man who was down and beaten up and near death because he came from Jerusalem. A priest who was a Jew passed him by. A Levite who was a Jew and a religious factor involved there passed him by. The Samaritan was an enemy of the Jews. Jews and Samaritans hated each other. And so the Samaritan was amazing because he was willing to help the Jew, but not just the Jew, he took a risk. Those roads were dangerous. There were robbers and thieves and murderers inhabiting these roads that people traveled, and it was dangerous to travel alone, and it was a very easy ruse to fake that you were hurt, and then when the person approached you, attack them or be attacked by somebody else. It was a risk. This Samaritan took a risk. He took time. He gave money. And he even said, if you need more money, I'll give you more money. He did follow-up by coming back. His, oh, this is the best one. His pre, he dropped his prejudices. You hear that? He dropped his prejudices to get past those so he could help. 
I firmly believe that even in churches like our churches, we have been taught some biases in our life and even our church life. I'm sorry, I grew up in this church, or one like it. And we were taught some biases. There are people you stay away from. There are people you don't marry. There are people you don't hang out with. And there were some biases in that. And sometimes even we Christians of a conservative brand have to get past our biases to love somebody else. Can you handle that? Think about it. If I had enough time and courage, I'd tell you what some of them are. And may still, before I'm out of Dodge. Prejudice is dropped. And here's number six and seven. I didn't put on your notes. Here's six. Reputation. His reputation was at stake. He could have been slandered every which way, every which way by his Samaritan friends. You helped a Jew? You've got to be kidding. You're not welcome here anymore. You're not welcome here anymore. You're not welcome here. And the seventh thing is sacrifice. This man made a significant sacrifice of time, energy, emotion, and money to make a difference. The results, however, were, here we go, number Number one is life and health. Then we're going to read them from reverse, bottom up. Next, after life and health, the man was given hope. He experienced grace and had a likelihood of even encountering faith before it was all. Why? Because the groundwork had been laid. So he would listen to the witness. Yeah, some Samaritans were, were, were believers, by the way. Uh, and so the opportunity for, for faith. The results of any form of helping are giving life and health, hope, grace, and faith. Serving can be in the form of volunteer service. Do you know that? You can serve out there. You can serve in here. You can serve through the church. Serving can be in or with the church. My call to ministry was a team effort. I've heard many testimonies of call to ministry. I know what most of them are like. People heard voices from God. My call to ministry was a team effort. I believe God was at the center of that team, nudging me, prodding me. But various individuals along the way spoke into my life and contributed to my sense of call to ministry. I guarantee you that. My openness helped. I never resisted a sense of call to ministry. It, wasn't, it just wasn't in my computer to, to resist a call to ministry. That helped. But my various volunteers in the life of the church, both in the church and beyond the church, listen, my various volunteer efforts... I think were a very significant part of my sense of calling to ministry. You say, what are you talking about? Well, I was, I was the Sunday school secretary at age 14, reported in front of the whole congregation, all, all the class attendance records. So I was getting in front of people in a church setting. So I, I, was, I did that. I was, I, I was um, and in the process, that I was also the custodian. Did you, you know, that was a great experience. I started, as a, I started at the top and worked my way to where I am right now. I started as a custodian. I helped clean the church before I ever preached my first sermon or was in charge of anything in the church. I, I was I was a, a peer youth leader in our church, in our service. I was the I was the church bus doorman. I would open the door, climb off, greet people, welcome in, and close the door. I was at age sixteen the church bus driver. That was not the brightest decision they made. When that happened, God said, "Son, you're not going to do this. You're going to do this." But I'm convinced that that was a part of the teamwork of a call to ministry for me. It was all those ways of... You never know how God may lead you through your acts and works and words of service to other people. Serving. Serving in and beyond the church is a part of God's pathway to helping fulfill your life. This morning as we wrap up our time together, we're going to make a, a final gesture of prayer about this, what I'm challenging you to consider in terms of your life and, and serving. But we're also going to invite our, our uh, new board members. So all you who are board members, please come up here and find your way to the platform. Just kind of come right behind me if you would right now. Um, we recently elected the different offices of the church. There's been a reconfiguration of the board, the constellation of our board. It's a bit smaller, leaner, meaner group. Not meaner, uh, just smaller. <laughs> Bad word there. Uh, in other words, we're, we're better able to make decisions a little bit speedier these days. So the group's going to come up and join us up front. And we're going to have a prayer for them and an installation service for them. Uh, and then we're going to pray together about uh, what's coming for us. So these are your, uh, these are your leaders. Let's we'll give them a round of applause. Say thank you to them. And 
And these, what's that? Oh, we have more. Oh, come on up, Cam. Get on up here. Cam's joining us here. Here are the names up here. I'll call off the names. Just raise your hand. You, most of you know some of these, but but let's just... Okay, uh, interim pastor Dave Holdren. Uh, spiritual elder, Dennis Milstead. Dennis. Doug Miller, financial elder, right here. Recording elder, Raymond, right over here. Administrative elder, Kim, right over here. Uh, uh, assimilation elder, Connie, right there. Worship and arts elder, Jeremy, right here. Who do we have over here? Well, we have these outreach elder, Kelly Michael. Where are you, Kelly? She's around someplace. She's doing her thing. Trustee, Mark Lotz, right over there. And uh, Corey Francis, trustee. Corey's not even with us this morning. Okay, and Christian Ed Director, Sheena. Sheena Weed is right here. Would you please welcome your, your wonderful board? These are... These these are these are quality quality people represent. I always let you know that. In my work with your church, there's been a lot of work we've had to do uh, to make what we think is some forward progress. But these these guys have been wonderful to work with. I just want to let you know how amazing this experience has been for me, largely because of you. And that's why we want to do this uh, presentation today, which will include all of you in just a few moments. So here we go. Ladies and gentlemen, it's recorded in the book of Acts of the Apostles that when the early church was growing and the number of disciples was multiplying and the duties of the church was so increased, it became diversified and difficult to manage. So in order to do that, the God helped to choose people who are full of good report, good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom to assist in administering the affairs of the church and that the officers thus chosen by the church were set before the apostles who had laid hands on them and prayed for them. Therefore, we, the pastor and the people of this church, Harry's Memorial, will call upon you all to hear and join in this pledge of trust to Christ and his church. So please listen as we give you the pledge of leadership and officers in our church. Trusting in Jesus Christ, the great head of the church, do you humbly promise him and his church that you will be faithful to the extent of your abilities, to all the known duties and responsibilities assigned to you as an officer of this church? Will you endeavor to be regular in your attendance, cheerful in your service? I like that one. Cheerful in your service, wholehearted in your giving, open-minded to the planning, patient in the face of difficulties and challenges, persistent in the face of mountains we face, and Christ-like in your faithfulness to his service. So do you cheerfully and yet solemnly accept the obligations of this pledge? And if so, please say, I do. Thank you very much. We, the pastor and officers of this church, will call upon the members and friends of the church to hear and join in this pledge of loyalty by those who, who have selected these to give leadership to us. So would you please stand together? Having chosen, having elected these officers and leaders to guide us in the administration of our church, we, as its members and friends, do now pledge our loyalty to its work and promise our consideration of the plans and our friendly cooperation, I love that, in the service suggested to us. And so, do you all, this is an important statement, do you all cheerfully, <laughs> I love this word, do you all cheerfully and yet solemnly accept the obligations of your pledge of support and prayer for these? And so please say, we do. All right. At this time, let's uh, just remain standing. Let's have a time of prayer. This is, by the way, a big week. Uh, your, your elders and your search team and your board complete our interviews about possible candidates for leadership for our church, and likely this week we'll identify who they feel is a first candidate to us. And so this is a very, very big week for all of us. So let's pray for God's greatest guidance and wisdom on these because uh, as elders and search team and board, they all work together to identify their sense of direction for who shall lead us in the days to come. That uh, choice will then come to you as members of the church for voting, and it's a process that's going to be a very, very significant one for our lives together and our future. It's good stuff. So let's, uh, let's pray together for them and for us. Father, today we thank you for the honor and privilege of serving your church. We pray today as we have listened to your word speak to us, your message, help each one of us consider how to better serve in our world. 
Help us to serve better in our homes, families, and marriages. Help us, Father, to realize the importance of doing something to be of service in the church and through the church. Help us, Father, to figure out how to be, yep, better neighbors, better neighbors. And give us guidance, Lord, this week through this group. We believe that somewhere out there is a person or persons who will be the leaders you anoint for our days of service as a church. Give us, Father, the person that is your choice. Help us to sense your mind in understanding the calling for the future of leadership of this amazing, wonderful Heritage Memorial Church. So for your guidance, we pray. For your assistance, we ask. And would you please give the wisdom, the endurance, and the grace to those who are leading and those of us who are following, that we will be seen as a church that really works together to accomplish your will and your ways. In Christ's amazing name, and all the people said, let's give our leaders a round of applause one more time. Thank you all. God bless you. Thank you so much. All right, I want to simply give you the words. Um, do, you, do you know this song? Uh, uh, why don't you join me here? I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you, O my soul rejoice. Take joy, my King, in what you hear. May it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. Beautifully done, and we mean that, don't we? Amen. God bless you. Thank people around you for being here. Let them know you care that they're here today. God bless you. See you later. Amen.